Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. Tonight, a look at the downtown revitalization of one West Valley city hoping to attract visitors and businesses. We'll talk about an exhibit featuring historic maps from the U.S.-Mexico border, plus a foundation offering students support services and educational opportunities. All this coming up next on Horizonte. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you for joining us. One West Valley City is hoping to attract new businesses and tourists by revitalizing its downtown area. Paseo de Luces, or Path of Lights, is Tullis's downtown project. The project includes improvements to Van Buren Street from 91st to 96th Avenue. Joining me to talk about this is Paul Magallanes, Director of Economic Development for the City of Tullison. Paul, welcome to Horizonte. Thank you for having me. Uh, it, it, this is a fascinating project. I told you off camera that, that I used to go to church in, in Tullison when we first moved to the valley, and that back then it was a real sleepy little uh, agricultural town, and it's not much bigger now, but, but a whole new look. Tell us about it. Well, uh, frankly, that was my first introduction to Tullison as well. Uh, my mother, when I used to live in Southwest Phoenix, used to love going to church in the same church that I'm, I'm sure you went to. Uh, so back then it was a, a you know, a primarily agriculture community, um, but uh, it's small by design. Uh, we like to say we're small, but in the middle of it all. Uh, we're a small community in the Southwest Valley. We're bordered on three sides by Phoenix and to the west by Avondale. Um, we are a community of 7,000 residents. And, and this particular project kicked off, what, about four or five years ago? It's been about a four-year adventure for us, yes. It's been about a 30-year aspiration, but a four-year construction, conceptual design type uh, um, project. Well, let's show some pictures of how it came out, and then I want to ask you how you got to this stage. We've got some pictures that we want to run. This, uh, I understand, is kind of like the central greeting area? Or? That's our central plaza. That's critical to any downtown redevelopment project when you're trying to have placemaking. Uh, it's very important to have people to have a place where they can congregate and uh, that's how we accomplished it here. This was a partnership with our uh, elementary school. And then some public seating here. Yeah, all of our seating in our downtown is social style seating. You won't find a bench in our downtown. Uh, it's designed for people to be able to sit, converse, and have an, an, an active uh, engagement. And we've got a few more pictures. Here's one of, uh, as I understand, a principal component of the project is public art, and this is one example. The public arts component I can go on forever on that piece because it's the part that I'm most proud of. Um, we partnered with the West Valley Arts Council Gallery 37 Project, which is a youth um, arts program. And our mayor and council were adamant that they wanted to have a component of this project that they put in the hands of youth. And a major component was uh, our arts program. Uh, we have seven arts pieces in our downtown. Each piece is reflective of a a tradition, some aspect of our heritage in our community, and these students did a great job of translating that into sculptures in our downtown. And we've got a couple of more pictures we're going to put up on the screen as we talk, but um, you started this project, this is another view of the, of the central gathering area, right? Yes, it is. You, you started this project kind of in the throes of, of one of the worst economic periods that the uh, valley has ever seen. How could you afford to do it? Well, we're, we're fortunate. We're fortunate to have had an economic development plan that focused on a very stable source of revenue. Uh, during the heavy growth areas in the, in the valley, when people were focusing on developing um, residential and the retail that comes along with it, our community wanted to stay small. We, knew, we know who we are in Tolleson. We're a small community. We want to stay small. Uh, so during that growth era, we went after projects that other communities weren't necessarily interested in at that time, industrial projects. So we brought in a lot of uh, warehousing and distribution facilities, light manufacturing operations. These um, developments all created a huge base of um, investment uh, upon which we derive property taxes. Property taxes are pretty stable, uh, especially when you compare them to the fickle sources of revenue of uh, sales, tax, and housing. So we've uh, been able to enjoy a very stable source of revenue. So during the downturn, when uh, most communities were suffering from uh, the, the downturn, we were not impacted very much. So you're small, you want to stay small, you have a stable source of income. Why the felt need to do something like this? 
Well, that's the sole purpose of doing economic development is to reinvest in the community. Uh, the council uh, is, is confident that this will increase the quality of life for our community. It will bring new people into our downtown. It will help people experience Tolleson for who we really are. Um, the mantra for our downtown is come see Tolleson in a whole new light. Uh, so we want people to come in and, and experience what Tolleson is really about. I imagine, though, given the history in, in, in the city and its development, uh, this was not without controversy. There's always uh, some folks in the community that will oppose progress, um, but doing nothing was not an option for our council. We have a council of action, and in the seven years that I have been working for this community, we have seen great progress. Uh, so yes, there were some concerns about uh, putting our Van Buren Street on a diet. We put the road on a diet and took some, some lanes away from the vehicular traffic and exchanged it for pedestrian pathway. Uh, and uh, that, that created some concern about traffic congestion. Um, but uh, in the end, I think we've made believers of, of even the naysayers. We're almost out of time. I know that the, the, the paseo itself is done, but, but there are plans to, to see it develop and grow. Tell us about that. Well, right now, our primary purpose is to, is to try and help um, residents in the valley and also businesses in the valley to help believe in our value proposition for our downtown. We want, we want to attract them to our downtown and, and encourage investment in our downtown. Um, so that, that's our next, next uh, uh, goal. And maybe some additional retail and, and entertainment? That's exactly what we're looking for, creating an entertainment district where people can come, shop, walk, enjoy the artwork, and uh, just have an experience. That's what consumers are looking for these days are experiences, so we're trying to create that for them. Well, you've done a great job, and, and we very much appreciate you joining us on Horizonte to talk about this project, Paul Magallanes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. To find out more information about what's on Horizonte, go to azpbs.org and click on the Horizonte tab at the top of the screen. There you can access many features to become a more informed Horizonte viewer. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button or by scrolling down to the bottom of the page for the most recent segments. Learn about more specific topics like arts and culture and immigration. You can also find out what's on Horizonte for the upcoming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or you want to buy a video, that's all on our website too. Other features include our collection of website links and a special page for educators. While you're there, show your support for Horizonte with just one click. Discover all that's on Horizonte. Visit azpbs.org, Horizonte, today. Watch sneak previews of what's coming soon to 8. Go to azpbs.org slash previews today. Imagined Regents map, exhib map Exhibit uh, displays rare historical maps from the collection of Simon Burrow, collector and global industrialist. Mr. Burrow donated the collection in 2012 to the ASU School of Transborder Studies. The collection illustrates the historical relationship between Mexico and the United States. Here now to talk about this collection is Teresa Avila, Program Coordinator for the ASU School of Transborder Studies. Teresa, welcome to Horizonte. Um, I, I've had a chance to look at some of the pictures of the maps that are just fascinating. And, and they date from what, the 16th century to, to the 19th? Uh, to the present. Uh, I think one of the uh, most recent maps in the collection is from the 1980s. Tell us about Simon Burrow and how we put together this collection. Um, Simon was uh, interested in understanding the borderlands, uh, the region between U.S. and Mexico where he had uh, factories on both sides of the border. And uh, he began that collection uh, as a hobby and used the maps uh, within his space at the factory um, for dialogue with customers, employees, etc. And when he sold the factories, uh, he took the maps on the road and curated an exhibition and toured it uh, around numerous uh, university colleges. And at some point you decided to donate the collection to the School of Transborder Studies. That's right. You then have turned it around and, and created a new exhibition called uh, Imagined uh, uh, Regions. Correct. And, and it's not the entire collection. There are what, 120 maps in the collection? Correct. Um, but it's a portion of them with a particular theme, which is what gives rise to the title. Explain that. Um, the theme Imagine Regions uh, speaks to a number of aspects of imagining the Americas and the people that live in the Americas and along the borderlands uh, between the U.S. and Mexico uh, area. 
And um, in looking at the maps, uh, we designed the, the exhibition uh, around the idea of imagining the Americas uh, as explorers discovered uh, and then ex uh, colonized the Americas. Um, and maps were produced uh, to help inform a European audience about this very foreign place. Um, there was a lot of imagination that was yeah. Uh, th these are not maps place. you would want to take with you into the desert and try to find something. Correct. I mean, there was some effort to actually um, to understand the region and the landscape, but due to issues of access and lack of technology, uh, that was really impossible. And so there was a lot of speculation both on the explorer's part and on cartographer's part in trying to imagine what this, this very foreign place was and who lived there and what it looked like. And within that, um, there was a lot of stories uh, that also helped to fuel the imagination. Well, we've got uh, uh, pictures of several of the maps. The first one is perhaps the, the most speculative, or if you want to talk about imagination, the seven cities of gold are reflected on this map? That's right. And um, cities that never existed, of course. Well, in the imagination of many, it existed. And um, actually, that, that story of Cibola um, can be traced back as early as the 13th century in medieval times in the search for this place of, of riches, uh, which is, could be said of a number of places um, and, and myths that we're familiar with, uh, for instance, the Fountain of Youth. Uh, but here in the map, um, to the top right corner, you can see seven separate structures, which represent what would be the seven cities. And it's actually positioned, it's, it's the, the map itself is a little skewed in perspective because really this is not a map that's created based on geographical knowledge, but speculation likely from the boat looking towards the land. And, uh, and so it seems as if they're positioning it somewhere in Arizona or along the borders of what is today the U.S.-Mexico border. And this map dates from 1549? Uh, no, this map is actually from 1597. And uh, it's one of the earliest maps that we have, one of our more valuable maps. And uh, it's, it's just rich with um, that element of uh, mythology and inventiveness and early exploration. It definitely represents that. We've got several other maps we want to put on the screen that, that um, uh, indicate for, uh, in one way or another, a variety of different sources. What does this one show us? Um, that's actually showing, um, as many of the maps do, uh, the Americas and uh, different regions. Uh, oftentimes, ma the maps are being produced by different international groups. Yeah, th this, this is in French. Yes, and like. so you'll have the French powers coming in and competing with Brit the British powers. Uh, Russia is represented at times, which is kind of an interesting element. You don't always hear about Russia's presence in exploration. Um, but you'll have all the international pre uh, players involved in trying to lay claim to the land, and so that you'll have efforts in uh, making these maps rather documentary of what they claim to hold and what they claim to have seen and know. Now, this map is a piece of art, really, in many ways. Yes. What does it show? This map is one of the rare maps that we have in the collection that actually incorporates uh, figures. And so you have the map in the middle uh, that shows the Americas, and then the artist has attempted to reflect um, some of the many elements that you'll find, uh, people, flora, fauna, so you have animals, uh, you have vegetation, uh, and you actually have an effort to represent different groups uh, based on class and the way they're dressed. Uh, and it's just a really wonderful representation that relates really to the tradition of costumbrismo or uh, representing uh, people from the Americas for a European audience. Now, this one dates from the early 1700s, but it's about 100 years after the last one, uh, the first one we saw. And it looks much more representational. I mean, that looks like a relatively accurate map of, of the Americas. Some will be more seemingly accurate than others. Um, and what's interesting is you'll have all these international uh, players representing the Americas, but they're not sharing information. And so what one country knows about the region because they've actually been there and have been able to geographically get, become familiar with the space, that information is not necessarily shared. And so, um, for instance, uh, there's great speculation that California is an island uh, in the 18th century. Uh, and some folks know that California is not an island and it, that it's represented as a peninsula in maps, and yet you still have a, a wide proliferation of maps that show something otherwise. And so um, the maps are, are, are wonderful in terms of understanding knowledge production. Many of these maps were circulated in atlases and produced for atlases. Uh, and so it allows us uh, to remember to question our, our knowledge and sources for knowledge. And this map looks much more current than any of the other ones we saw. 
It's from the 19th century, mid 19th century, uh, and uh, actually this map was produced by a capitalist who was interested in um, establishing routes for transport, both steamship routes, uh, and actually the gentleman that was involved in the production of this map uh, is involved with uh, the Pony Express. And this map was part of their attempt, his company's attempt to get that, that job, that, uh, that opportunity to produce uh, modes of transportation both for mail and uh, people. And so uh, what's interesting about this map is it does show a speculation of Arizona and, and New Mexico uh, in terms of a stacked relationship as opposed to being side by side. And so again, many of the maps represent the inventive nature of map making. And we've got one last map that we want to put up on the screen and, and talk about. Uh, is, is this the one that shows California as an island? It does not. Um, what's really uh, nice about this map is that it's, uh, it highlights uh, the Native American populations, uh, what we like to call transborder communities uh, at the School of Transborder Studies. And uh, many of the maps document the presence of not only Native American groups, but missions, uh, explorers. And so the maps help to relate the idea of transborder communities interacting um, historically, uh, which allows us to then talk about those same interactions in the present. And, and that's really the goal with the maps in the exhibition, is to uh, engage in a dialogue uh, about open borders, uh, movement, natural movement of people, and uh, you know, promote a cooperative space uh, where people exchange and share resources. And how long is the exhibition going to be on display? The exhibition is up until March 12th. At the Mexican consulate? At the Mexican consulate, and we are willing and available to uh, conduct tours for the public, and if anyone's interested in doing that, um, they can contact us at ptc at asu.edu and uh, let us know they're interested in a tour. We're welcome to do small groups, large groups, educational groups, uh, to share the maps and, and yeah, one Tell last question. What's on exhibition on exhibit is a small portion. It's about what 20, 20 it's about maps. About twenty maps. So, so what are you going to do with the rest? Um, we've uh, digitized the maps. We're looking to create interactive web maps. Uh, we are interested in taking the maps out to the communities. Uh, for instance, we can take a group of maps to the Heard Museum, possibly, or where Native American groups might be able to come and talk to the maps and critique the maps. Uh, we can connect with our cartography groups and talk about what the value they see in these maps and understanding um, how the maps relate to uh, spatial ideas today. So there's a lot of opportunity we're seeking to uh, utilize the maps uh, as part of our broader project in understanding the borderlands, understanding uh, border zones, and have a dialogue around um, natural movement, uh, cooperative space, uh, sharing resources, and understanding the very historical nature of that reality. Well, Professor Avila, ASU, let us know when you get to that stage, and we'll have you back to talk about Wonderful. it. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you so much for joining us on the Appreciate it. Thank you. Horizonte, we want to hear from you. If you have comments, story ideas, or questions, email us at horizonte at asu.edu. The Challenge Foundation helps hardworking students break the cycle of poverty through education opportunities and support services. Joining me to talk about the foundation are Pam Frank Cole, Executive Director for the Challenge Foundation Phoenix Program, and Janice McFall, co-founder of the Challenge Foundation, thank you both for joining us to talk about this thank fascinating you. program that you and your husband started a number of years ago yes. in Denver. Why? Uh, <clears throat> we started the program in 1998 in Denver uh, because of uh, our work with uh, the Coalition of the Homeless and seeing so many children 
either in the homeless shelters or in the projects that were very intelligent, motivated children, but with very little uh, access to a good education. So we decided we needed to do something about this. It seemed like such a waste there were these children not to be able to get a good education. So through our association with some of the independent schools in Denver, uh, we were able to uh, acquire scholarships for children starting in the sixth grade. And uh, in, they're all college prep type schools. And um, we take them all the way through high school and also into college. So it, it's been very rewarding because the success of giving these children this opportunity has been just amazing. And you, you've now been at it for, for since 1998. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many kids have gone through the program? Uh, currently, we have about 100 children in high school, I mean in the, in the lower schools, and then we have 35 children in college, and then we have actually around 35 that have graduated from college, and that's in the Denver program. Uh, we also started a program in El Paso, Texas, and we have uh, around just under 40 girls in the program in El Paso. And then about three years ago, we decided to come to Phoenix because Don and I were spending time here in Phoenix, and we wanted to get involved in the community here. So we uh, contacted uh, All Saints Episcopal Day School and talked with their uh, headmaster and admissions director, and as it would happen, they were very interested in starting a, a scholarship diversity program there. So we've started a partnership with them, and it's really, and it really has gone very well. Well, and in large part because of your efforts, Pam. Yes, we, um, we work really hard with the public schools in our community, the Boys and Girls Club, some of the refugee agencies, and they are able to identify the students that are really um, showing strong potential for academic success and showing some motivation but also showing some need. And one difference uh, the Phoenix program from, from the program in, in Colorado is you start younger. You start looking at kids in the fourth grade. Why is that? We do. Um, our primary partner school, as Janice mentioned, is All Saints Episcopal Day School. Their natural transition point for middle school begins in fifth grade. And so in order to make the transition as smooth as possible for our scholars, we wanted to keep with that um, school model. So we identify fourth graders to then start in our program as fifth graders. And how many kids have been put into the program thus far? We currently have 11 scholars um, at All Saints Episcopal Day School, um, and our model is to identify between four and six scholars every year that we will admit and then see all the way through their college graduation. And what's the process for making the selection? It's pretty intense because the, our commitment is so long. Um, we assess the, each applicant's um, academic abilities, looking at standardized test scores, their report cards. We look at attendance. Um, the parents actually fill out their own application as well um, because that parental piece has to be present. It's a long journey and you have to have um, multiple people speaking into your life to encourage you along. Um, such a challenging journey. Um, and so we make sure that we have an opportunity to talk with parents and other family members as well. Um, and then we do our testing evaluation um, to make sure that the kids can be successful at um, a school like All Saints Episcopal Day School because the last thing we want is to put a child in a school where they can't be successful. Now, I imagine you have lots of connections and so you, you have ways of identifying these students, but yes. if somebody watching the program wants to get more information, how would they do that? Um, they can go to our website. Um, it's very easy. It's thechallengefoundation.org um, and there is a, um, a way to fill out an interest form and contact us. Janice, uh, um, the program provides not only scholarship monies to take people from sixth grade or in, in the case of Phoenix, fifth grade all the way through college. You do a lot of other stuff, a lot of support services, and we've got about a minute left. Describe what you're doing. Uh, often uh, people think of the Challenge Foundation as just a scholarship program, but it's you know so much more than that. We have a mentoring program, we have tutoring, we have a, a summer school program that's a, approximately six weeks where the, they are uh, do academics in the morning and then extracurricular activities in the afternoon. 
Um, we also have a community service component uh, where the, the children do uh, work in the community to give back. So, you know, I can safely say that there's probably no other program like this that you, has you take care that's of so from holistic. Start to finish. Yeah. Exactly. It's a fascinating program, exactly. and, and we're delighted to have you both on Horizonte to tell us about it. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. And that is our show for tonight. From all of us here at 8 and Horizonte, thank you for watching. I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.